Center for Parent Youth Understanding and the CPYU Podcast Network, you're listening to The Word in Youth Ministry, a podcast by youth workers for youth workers, where we give insights, strategies, and helps for effectively teaching God's Word to our students. Here we are on episode 46 of the Word in Youth Ministry. My name is Kyle. I'm, the youth, I'm a youth pastor in Northeast Ohio, and I'm here as usual with my friends Matt, San Antonio, Texas, and Linda in Orlando, Florida. And today we have a guest as we're thinking about um, just building a teaching plan for our youth ministries. Um, I was trying to think of people I know in the youth ministry world who do this well, and a friend of mine, Phil Lineweber, who's about two hours west of where I'm at in Canfield, Ohio. Um, he is in Mansfield, Ohio. He is joining us today. So, Phil, thanks for joining us on the Word and Youth Ministry. Thanks for having me, Kyle. And now, Phil, I do have a question. We um, quickly usually talk about different things that we're doing in our student ministries or personal hobbies. Um, I was just curious, have you ever heard of dragon boating before? <laughs> Wait, wasn't that on an episode not too long ago? Oh, good. Okay, good. We, we, <laughs> you know, Matt and I talk about golf or about the World Cup, but Linda, can you give us and our listeners an update on your dragon boating? You know, honestly, I haven't done it in several weeks because I was out of town and I had a work thing and I was sick. And actually, they just had a race that I wasn't able to join. But I mean, they do want me to join for races this year. They asked me to do some extra practices with them. So I might be doing some dragon boating races this year if the timing works out. I have a t-shirt or uh, it's not really a t-shirt. It's, Would it's, you consider it's like a jersey? A, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like a jersey for the team. I went and watched one of their races in October that was local. Mm. Um, and then I was like, okay, now I understand how these work and I might actually join in them. Well, so, I I yeah. knew I knew, you know, here I am in Ohio. We have a guest, Phil's here in Ohio. We we don't have dragon boating. They, they probably have it. San Antonio. Do they have it in San Antonio? I don't know. It sounds like they're big boats. I don't know if you can get them on the San Antonio River, the Dirty Little Creek, um, as it's often been called by a certain NBA announcer. Oh, oh wow. Well, you know, we're not here to talk about dragon boating, but Phil, I, I was just curious, but I guess you've yeah, listened. To this is episode. it kind of like, I don't know, LARPing meets like the aquatic realm? <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> LARPing is like where they have swords made out of duct tape and PVC pipe and you pretend you're having wars or something like that. And so is that kind of like that on boats? Like, are you a Viking? Well, uh, <laughs> we're not battling each other like that. That's there's the just, best question we've ever paddles. had on the podcast. <laughs> Linda, are you battling. a Viking? Yes. <laughs> we're just battling, but it's on, it's on boats that have a dragon head at the, at the like front mm. and a dragon tail at the back. Mm. So well, if if you're listening and you're still listening to this episode of the Word and Youth Ministry, <laughs> go on Google, search dragon boating, and now you'll know another one of Linda's hobbies. But like I said, we're not we're not here to talk only about dragon boating. We're here, episode 46, to talk about building a teaching plan with Phil. So Phil, um, can you just tell us a little bit um, about your current role at your church, but then also about your time in youth ministry at that church. And just generally, as we think about building a teaching plan, um, how you have been able to do that and what that has looked like. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm at Berean Baptist Church in Mansfield, Ohio. We are, I've been here, my wife and I have been here eight years. This is our eighth year. And so this past summer, I moved into an associate role um, and so I'm less involved in student ministry week to week, though that's changed the spring. I'm kind of back in that world and uh, it's fun to be back. But yeah, so I oversee all now I oversee all discipleship and our strategies for moving people basically from visitor, you know, guest to attender to involve using their gifts, serving and connected in community. And so really, you know, exactly what a youth pastor does for teens, but for the whole church, you know, just trying to help mm -hmm. people get connected and grow in their faith. So. Yeah. And so when you arrived there about eight years ago and you were in the student ministry world, yeah. I remember um, one of the first times uh, I met you wasn't actually in person, but was on a call. We were talking about something. I know you were um, working at a college and then you went from that setting to working with students. And so one of the first things we have to do um, when we're thinking about being a youth worker is thinking about what am I going to teach my students? 
So yeah. as as you thought about that, how did you getting into this role? And for the one one of the first times, I know you were doing some student ministry before, but now yeah. in this role, you were you were leading the ministry. What are some things you had to consider when you thought about building a teaching plan? Yeah, well, I taught as a lay person, like a, a group of about fifty junior hires for three years as a in a in a church in. Lincoln. Let, let's just pause there for a second. Teaching fifty middle schoolers is no joke, <laughs> dude. The great thing about teaching junior hires, I tell people this, you will know exactly how you're doing by just looking out at the mm -hmm. audience. Like they don't lie that you can, know, you know, if you're boring, you know, if you're funny, they have adults are so much harder because they lie to you with their faces all the time. You might think you're killing it and they're all asleep, you know? And so, <laughs> but yeah, junior hires was great proving grounds. I failed a lot, you know, and, uh, I had a lot of freedom to teach and kind of what I wanted to. And so at that time I was in seminary and kind of taught alongside maybe some of the things I had done and tried some different curriculum out. So by the time I landed here, um, there were some things I wanted to teach, but I, I think I realized, uh, you know, a, a year or two in, I need, I'm just preaching kind of what's on my heart. I want to have a more systematic way of approaching this. And so, yeah, you know, I wanted to be strategic because I knew there were things I wanted to touch on with students uh, but I didn't really have a plan, you know, and something we say around here a lot, you probably heard is just like, you, you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. And so that was, so me and at the time, my junior high director, we began kind of exploring what are some of the resources out there that could help us develop a more holistic plan. We've got these kids for seven years. Our student ministry runs sixth through 12th grade, you know, we'll engage about 200 different students on any given month. And so how do we really create a plan to systematically move them through, you know, different different uh, ideas and concepts and scriptures and truths. So, And yeah. so last question I have for you right now, um, and then Matt and Linda are going to uh, comment on, on what you're about to share here um, and ask you some questions as we move ahead. One thing you did that caught my attention several years ago is you created like an institute for your students. So I, again, I want our listeners not to be scared, uh, scared away from the word institute, um, whether you're listening and you're a full-time youth worker or you're a volunteer or you're bivocational, um, having a plan, which this episode is about, is important. And depending on our setting and the time that we have to give to it, it's going to be more complex or less complex. But as you found yourself in your setting, Phil, how did you, you made an institute that had like a three-year rotation and how did you kind of form that and then start to implement that before you ended up shifting to a different role in your church? Yeah, so you know, basically we have two environments where we engage students. We have a Wednesday night gathering and that's more of a, a wide reach. We engage a high percentage of unchurched students Wednesday night. Um, it's an invite your friend environment. We definitely go deep. We talk about real things. And that kind of earlier period is when we really decided, hey, we found much like Matt said on episode on scope and sequence, you know, not long ago, talked about big buckets. And we identified for us, um, like eight buckets and it was you know apologetics missions evangelism biblical interpretation relationships spiritual disciplines a few others i can get those to you you can put them in the show notes but um you know those were like every year we want to hit a series of a, three to four weeks on one of those buckets and so as we mapped out a year at a time we would make sure we hit all of those buckets but then i realized after doing that for a few years this is where the word institute kind of came out of is we also had this Sunday school environment where we could, we had more of the committed core that were part of that. And uh, I wanted to one, add value to that time. And I wanted to be strategic about, hey, how is this different than Wednesday night? What are we missing? And we really were missing, I think, a time to have more of the classroom environment. Um, you know, but I didn't want to call it school because the connotation there is not cool for students. And I want parents to know, though, this is serious and we're going to, um, have homework. We don't necessarily have them report on it, but we're going to give them homework every time it's for those students who want to go deeper. And so I used a college a Bible college model. I looked and saw what is the every Bible major, what do they look at? Your systematic theology, one, two, New Testament, Old Testament, biblical interpretation, apologetics, evangelism. Um, we we grabbed all of those church history. I know Matt mentioned that on the one episode. That was that's we got two on church history. And so we we grabbed um, of those a three-year plan. We said, hey, let's do six semesters, two in the spring, two summer, two fall. You know, fall goes into winter, spring kind of comes out of winter. And so we mapped out a plan to go on a rotation for three years. And um, the, the concept for three years came out of the idea, 
you know, students change a lot every year. And so they're going to pick up different things and, and learn different things at different ages. And so let's kind of, you know, um, not pin ourselves into a corner too much for too long. Let's try to get this rotation and not that we couldn't add an elective here or there as there were needs and different things. So, yeah. Phil, this looks really cool. Um, I'm interested, you know, Linda and I really like the institutes as well, but we, um, so I'm sorry, that was a terrible uh, Calvinistic joke. Um, <laughs> cut that, Chris. We don't want we don't want this to be in there. It, I was um, too slow. It took me a second. I'm, I'm with you now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. No. The, this is really cool. So, how do you decide? Like, when you say you, you got some students who want to go deeper first, like, what are the age range on these students? Do they, you know, quote unquote, apply or just say, "Hey, I want to do that"? Do you have another class for those who don't want to be a part of this? Um, and and yeah. So, can you just yeah get down to some of those kind of nitty gritty questions? Yeah. Well. And uh, the interesting thing about this is it actually was involved in another pivot we had. Our Sunday school at the time was competing with our gathering. And what I was seeing was um, Sunday school, we'd have, you know, about between 70 and 100 students show up. 80% of those students were not going to our gathering with their parents at all. They were not in a gathering. And so I really believe that student ministry, what done right, is partnering with parents to make disciples in the home. And so in my mind, I was like, we're, we're actually having another church, an op, you know, you're, and we're not connecting our students to our lead pastor, to our worship, to our culture as a, you know, they're just a subset of the, of the greater body. And so I, I didn't like that. And so we moved our Sunday school for youth to our earlier service. And so the only kids that without an effort would come were the two service families that were already coming and their parents were serving or involved in a community or doing something else or just really committed to be there for our, we have two services on Sunday morning. And so immediately we dropped over 50%. Um, and so I wanted to add value to that time to get those kids back out, knowing it'd be harder to get them there earlier. Um, but for me, we, we've gained numbers in our gatherings and you look around second service the teens are worshiping and a lot of them sit there's a student section now a bunch of students sit together we've got more kids worshiping with our greater church which is a win and and so again we have a gathering for students it's wednesday night if you want to come and have you know your youth group experience and really be tailored to come wednesday night this is for students that are really committed and your their parents want you to be discipled get here early and grow together in the word institute Bill, I just quickly, uh, what you just said is so countercultural in the student ministry world. You you made a pivot that actually cost you the number of students that were attending your student Sunday school in order because you think it's so important for students to worship in the main worship gathering. Is that just what you said? Yeah. 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 I just, I want our listeners to hear that because so often we as youth workers can sometimes want them to come to, to student ministry and to do this. And it's important. However, we, we don't want to get in the way of students witnessing and not only witnessing, because that has a passive connotation, but participating in the worship of God, not only with other middle school and high school students and leaders, but where they, they see people younger than them. And they're also worshiping God with people likely decades older than them. So thanks for sharing that. Linda, go ahead. You can ask a follow-up question. I just, what you just said, Phil, uh, was such an encouragement to me. I wanted to point that out. Yeah, that that's important. Get them in that uh, Sunday worship gathering. Um, so, so I want to make sure I'm hearing. So the three-year part, you're saying you, you will um, repeat this every three years. So some student could hear the same material twice and that's kind of intentional on your part because, hey, three years from now, they'll get something else out of it, right? Yeah, yeah. And generally, you know, junior hires don't remember anything in five right. days. So, <laughs> you know, but yeah, and there's, there's freedom within that too. Like for instance, how a growth class um, or a Word Institute class like on biblical interpretation, that's something we do you know, just how I am, you know, we're going to go through a book of the Bible and practice biblical interpretation. How do you read the Bible right? Well, that that's going to change. You know, we're going to do a different book this time around. And so it might be the same class, but we're revisiting it through another book. And so, you know, you've already had, you probably get New Testament twice in your time from junior high to senior high, but, you know, you'll do a few different books and we'll emphasize maybe a different genre of scripture 
or, you know, a, a, and try to move through those as we talk about different biblical interpretation. And the same with like, um, you know, I, I built in it enough, like probably what you've seen has a lot of structure. I'm pretty ADHD, like a lot of youth pastors, you know, like if we took a one off and said, hey, I've got this missionary in, I want them to speak. It's not a big deal. Like we're not a slave to this. It's a tool to make us better as we seek to disciple our students. That's, That's helpful, good. Phil, because I think that um, as I think about our own student ministry here and those who are listening to this, um, we we want to have a plan because we want to be able to look um, not only forward, but be able to look back and to see what we've taught so that we can make the best use of our time. However, like you just said, there are opportunities um, to bring missionaries in, to bring in um, people to share testimonies, to say, you know what? Um, one thing I like to do here is if our senior pastor is not teaching, um, which is rare that he's in town and not teaching, but if that happens, um, I bring him into the student ministry and I call it Ask Anything with Pastor Nick. So the students can fire any question about the Bible and God and life to him. Um, but what you just said, I think is helpful that we're not a slave to the schedule, um, but we're letting it set the standard for moving ahead. So we're going to take a quick break here on episode 46 of the Word and Youth Ministry with Phil Line Weber as we're thinking about building a teaching plan. I do want to remind our listeners that um, this podcast is hosted by CPYU, which is known as the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. Um, if you go to cpyu.org, that's our website. We have hundreds, if not thousands of resources that have been produced over the years. But one that I want to highlight um, right now is one of our other podcasts is called Youth Culture Matters. Uh, that's hosted by our president, Walt Mueller. And um, it kind of goes parallel to what we're doing here on the Word and Youth Ministry. The Word and Youth Ministry, we're thinking specifically how to use the Bible and teach the Bible in student ministry settings. Um, youth Culture Matters, Walt is usually interviewing other youth workers or authors or pastors thinking through exactly what the title is, how youth culture matters and what is actually mattering in youth culture. So I wanted to point that out before we take a break. We'll take a quick break and be back here on episode 46 of The Word in Youth Ministry. I often hear grandparents say how glad they are that they don't have to raise kids in today's world. While these comments might not be very encouraging to those of us who are parents or who are doing youth ministry with kids today, they do recognize the fact that there are lots of confusing and dangerous cultural realities that kids need to navigate if they are going to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. In an effort to provide parents and youth workers with an easy-to-use tool designed to help kids find their way through the choices they face in today's world, I've written a new little book that can be used individually or in small groups, A Student's Guide to Navigating Culture. It's the shortest book I've ever written, but it's the one I believe will have the greatest impact in terms of discipling the emerging generations. If you want to teach your kids how to live in today's culture while following God's will and way, check out this new little book, A Student's Guide to Navigating Culture. You can learn more and order copies at cpyu.org. Well, welcome back to the Word and Youth Ministry podcast. This is episode 46, where we're talking to uh, Phil Lineweber about uh, his scope and sequence. And Phil, some of the things that, you know, we've been talking about, thinking about is, you know, students are not able to come very often or as often as we would like them to, to our youth ministry programming. So with with a very involved and wonderful plan that you've laid out, like, how do you think about um, kind of attendance and uh, and some of, you know, structural um, flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's like one of the reasons we rotate every three years, kind of do a lot of the same content. You know, for us, as we've tracked it, our average student comes about half the time. You know, you got some kids that are there every week or almost every week. And then you got some kids that are very intermittent, but your average student's there two times a month. And so, you know, repeating through the same curriculum multiple times while they're a student going through sixth through 12th grade, really allows us to have more touch points to hit primary areas that we want to develop, you know, just their knowledge base about their faith and worldview. And so, yeah, you know, I think like having a plan in that way is, is key. Um, something else we've done is just reviewing, you know, like at the beginning of each lesson, how did we get here? You know, let's, let's go over the last three weeks. We've been walking through church history or walking through systematic theology. So at least they get to hear it. They get kind of that quick spark notes version and then you kind of introduce the new topic. So giving yourself that flexibility um, 
you know, something I heard, I think in a podcast that you guys did not long ago, just not feeling like if we're doing say new Testament survey, that hour that we have is not all new Testament survey, or it doesn't have to be, you know, you have time where the students break up and they do prayer. And so you might have time of sharing. You might have a missionary who's there and they could share a little bit of a testimony for 15 minutes, or you could do different things like that. Or there might be a a situation in the world or in our community, you know, a, a student ha is in a car accident and it's like, hey, we just need to pray for this family and mm -hmm. we're going to push pause on this and we're going to really do the better thing in this moment. And so, like I said earlier, we're not a slave to the plan. Um, the plan is just a tool to be consistent and to have, you know, be farsighted, but we, we want to be able to sensitive to where students are in any given moment and, and try to, you know, meet them. There's been a lot of times we've done a survey, say, hey, what do you guys want to talk about? And we've, you know, developed curriculum out of that. And some of those have been rich times, you know, and so, um, you know, try to just be flexible with it and not allow us to be, again, a slave to the curriculum. So, Phil, this three-year plan, um, you said, is for your Sunday morning slot, and it's designed after kind of Bible college curriculum kind of stuff. I'm wondering if you can speak to, so, like, how do you make your Wednesday nights and what you're covering there complement this maybe you don't have a full out plan over three years for it but do you have a different kind of focus um mm. of the sorts of things you're going through there as opposed to what you're doing on sunday morning yeah that's a great question you know i'd say the primary difference is the audience like i know we have students coming to that gathering who do not have a relationship with jesus so as we're articulating an idea even like spiritual disciplines we're articulating that idea on a Wednesday night through the lens of this student might not even have a relationship with Jesus yet. And so, you know, it's 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 definitely um, differently framed. The other thing is after our teaching, our teaching is a lot shorter on, on a Wednesday night. It's probably between 20 and 30 minutes. It's pretty tight. And we do worship. And then we break up for small groups where there's a lot of interaction and so what we found that's connected best with students is series that kind of uh, apply God's word to their lives. And so we're really pra a lot more practical, I would say. It's like, hey, where does the rubber meet the road of your biblical worldview and your life? Um, you know, we've done series on racism, sexuality. Um, you know, we've done some core doctrines, but again, it's framed in a way that's almost like we're trying to persuade the skeptic in the room and equip our students to talk to their friends who are far from the Lord about this issue too. So it's a much more missional emphasis, I'd say, whereas our Word Institute is a much more, you know, I, I use the word discipleship. Uh, I don't like that because I don't think evangelism and discipleship are, are different, I think, you know, but in terms of we are treating these kids as committed followers of Jesus who want to grow, want to go deeper. Hmm. And I think that along this topic, I'm actually, we'll go around, uh, all four of us can comment on this. For me, it's a more of a seasonal thing, but we've talked about this on previous episodes, but as people are thinking about building a teaching plan, thinking about scope and sequence, the question that normally comes up is, should I use curriculum or should I not? Or maybe we think about building a three-year plan and we're like, okay, I don't even, I don't even know where to start or I'm using curriculum. How does that fit in? Um, I was just thinking here, as Linda asked that last question, just a few curriculums that I might recommend to youth workers to look at. Um, I know Rooted, um, Rooted Youth Ministry, they have something called the Rooted Reservoir that I would recommend to you. I know Lifeway puts out something called the Gospel Project that we have found helpful here um, with our student ministry and kids ministry. No Reformed Youth Ministry puts out curriculum. Um, I also know Math Matthias Media has something called You, Me, and the Bible, which is just six weeks but can be used. For me personally, it's a seasonal type thing. Sometimes I'm making my own Bible studies that I'm teaching. Other times I like to use curriculum or I like to use curriculum to put in the hands of my volunteers. I just like to go around. Matt, how, how have you historically in youth ministry, are you someone who likes to go heavy on curriculum or maybe what, how would you recommend youth workers using curriculum? And then we'll go to Linda after. Yeah, I mean, definitely if I'm not teaching, I will want to put curriculum in the hands of my volunteer leaders and teachers or staff. Um, and I, I'm I'm really not the best person to ask about when it comes to curriculum, to be honest. I mostly write my own stuff if right. I'm not giving it to somebody else. Sorry. No, but what you just said, I think, is, is helpful because sometimes expecting a leader who's not um, continually teaching, it's hard for them to come up with a lesson. And maybe in some senses, we might not want them to 
because in curriculum, someone already did not all of the hard work, but a lot of the hard work that lays the foundation. So you're saying you would you would use it to put in the hands of one of your leaders. Yeah, and, and sometimes like I'll I'll have taught or written my own curriculum and then give that curriculum that I've just done to the leaders so that then they could reproduce that. Yeah. So that's what that's yeah, I've done that before. Yeah. That's helpful. Linda, I believe you said before that you've done multiple, but anything particular you'd want to recommend or remind our listeners or maybe new listeners when it comes to curriculum? And then Phil, we'll go to you next. Yeah, you know, a lot of the curriculum decisions just really come down to, can I find the thing that really fits my context? Like so many curriculums, it's like, hey, it it's a 12-week curriculum and it takes an hour to an hour and a half to go through each lesson. It's like, man, that's not what I can fit within my program. And so you kind of have to pick and choose or tell your leaders like, hey, don't do exactly what this says, tweak a little bit so it actually fits into what we're trying to do. As long as is it has that flexibility, you can often make it work. Um, one other series I have used some of um, and would think that the rest within the series are also good um, is something that New Growth Press puts out. Mm-hmm. So they do um, some that are specifically for students and some that are more broadly for adults, but you could still use them with students, like a gospel-centered series. So it could be the gospel-centered life in Mark, um, which they have one for students, or just the I think it's called like the gospel centered life for teens. There's a bunch of different studies they have that if that's something that would actually work well for your program, they, they are um, really well put together. So that's Mm. another recommendation I would have. Yeah, that's helpful. And all uh, for our listeners, these that have been mentioned will be in the show notes. Um, Matt's homemade (laughs) curriculum is also for sale. No, I'm just joking. But um, (laughs) what I think what Matt said is helpful, um, especially as we think about, Um, you know, for me, a lot of times on Wednesday nights, I'm teaching, I'll put my own lessons together, but just to, you know, remind youth workers who are listening again, we have, like we say a lot, we have to play the long game. One thing that is helpful is if you stay in one place long enough, I'm doing a series through the book of James right now that I did when all of our current students were in middle school. So although I'm freshening up my teaching, when I just made the youth group guide for this week, I took the questions that I used when all of these current kids were in middle school. So this is one way that if we stay in one place long enough in youth ministry, not that it gets easier or not that we always want to become so efficient with our time that we forget what we're doing, but then what that is one benefit of student ministry is even if we're using our own stuff, we can freshen it up because if you stay in one place long enough, eventually you will get new students in your student ministry. Phil, do you have anything else that, that you would add about curriculum or recommendations you would have? Maybe not even of what curriculum to use, but how you have found it helpful or warnings that you would guide people against? Yeah, well, one of the things I think about having a plan is then whether or not you write your own or curriculum, you like curriculum, you now have, you know what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. So if you've already decided, I want to do New Testament in this fall, you look and say, you just Google New Testament survey for students and you can look at those resources or ask some people in your network, hey, what's a good tool to go through the New Testament or church history? You know, so it's really kind of provided the outline that we can fill. And so like we have a lay leader helping teach um, the church 101, like your ecclesiology right now in our Word Institute. And so he found the Reformed Youth Ministry, their curriculum on Church 101 is great. And so he grabbed that one and he's using Wait, that. Wait, time out, time out. Linda, did that's you write mine. that one? That's yeah, that's Linda's. That. No way! That's awesome. Hey, they love it. They Fantastic. Love it. That was that was not planned. Yeah. I'm serious. I cannot be bought off. I was not bought off. Wow. Wait, wait, wait. So you're you're using it at Berean Baptist Church. You're using Linda's curriculum right now? I had no idea. And I had no idea. Mm. Watch out for that Presbyterian polity that's like slowly but surely <laughs> seeping into your church. Hey, hey, there's a lot of we're, we're we believe in biblical eldership, plurality of elders, man. Amen. Hey, <laughs> so yeah, that's you know when you have that outline, then okay, now we're going through this book of the Bible, and we know we're doing New Testament exegesis of Colossians. Well, you go to something like the Bible Project, and you watch the Colossians intro video. So Bible Project, if you don't know, those videos are just phenomenal. You know, just as an intro, or we did um. A, Word Institute class on the end times. And we found a book on the nonprofit's guide to end times. And it's just like hilarious. And we didn't make every student read it, but we had several students that read that whole book. And it was, it fit like a student's reading level. Not every student's going to read it, but if you 
kind of raise the bar while at the same time making things accessible. It's really neat to see what, what God does in some students' lives. I mean, I don't want to be I don't want to be the bottleneck uh, for future pastors and missionaries to ra be raised up in my in the local church. Like I want to unleash kids that are just passionate about Jesus. Um, so you want to, you know, put uh, stuff on the top shelf and the bottom shelf. And I think there's ways to do that. Um, one other one would be Right Now Media. We we use it, as, subscribe to it as a church, and we've used some series on there for our students. And again, that's a great way you can engage uh, lay leaders. It's a lot more accessible. Say, so, hey, can you watch this and write some questions that they can discuss? And so um, those are some of the options we do. I personally, like, you know, I've, I've got my master's degree from seminar. I love writing it. Even if I use a curriculum, I end up rewriting it. And so like for me, um, I just, you know, I, I use resources out there, but I like to write it myself. But um, I, I really, there's so many good resources out there. There's, there's so much um, just yeah. right at our fingertips. Oh man, this this not only has been the best episode because you asked Linda earlier about being a Viking, <laughs> but now uh, unplanned, your church is using curriculum written by Linda. Which again, one one thing, um, uh, because one thing at CPYU that we want to always be doing at the Center for Parent Youth Understanding is pointing people to different ministries that are helpful. One thing that Reformed Youth Ministry (RYM) does really well is they um, they have resources where they they have people write curriculum. And then it's free for those who are using it. So again, just to remind our listeners, I use their eschatology curriculum once, and you don't have to, like, especially because you're not paying for it, you don't feel guilty for not using the whole thing, but you can use it as a foundation that then you can teach off of. So Phil, last question for you. We just talked for around a half hour about building a teaching plan for students. Um, as those who are listening to this podcast, we all find ourselves at different places in our student or even children's ministry journeys. Uh, we have moments where we feel like our students love Jesus. We have moments where we feel like you mentioned earlier, no one's even listening to us. Why am I doing this? Um, what just encouragement, if, if someone came to you and said, Phil, um, you've been in student ministry for a while, what's, what's 30 seconds to a minute of encouragement that you would have for youth workers? What would you want to tell our listeners today? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just remain faithful, you know, and, and cling close to the Lord. You, you guys can see behind me because we got video here, um, but I have a verse here. It says, they will run and not be weary, weary. They will run and not faint. It's from Isaiah 40. It's one of my favorite verses. And it says, you know, the previous part is those who wait on the Lord. And uh, if you try to do ministry in and of your own strength, you will fail and fall. And so rely on the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit and know that you won't necessarily see fruit today or tomorrow or this year. It's a long game. And I really believe, and this is why I think your podcast is powerful, the word does not return void. And if we're sowing the word into the lives of our students, man, God will bring forth fruit. Um, and, and we believe that here at our church. And I believe in this podcast and what you guys are trying to do. Yeah. And so continue to be faithful. Um, a friend of mine, every time one of us would go up to preach, the thing he always says, like, give them Jesus. You've got nothing to bring except Christ in you. Mm. Give, them, give them Jesus and his word. And man, great things will happen. Mm. Um, you know, one other thing I, I believe after, you know, you guys are a lot of your veterans. Uh, if you've been at one church for a longer period of time. I believe that faithfulness and uh, longevity and integrity, when those are combined, you will see fruitfulness. Mm. So don't quit. Don't jump ship when the going gets tough. You're about to break through into a new season of fruitfulness. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for that encouragement. And I hope that those who are listening today, whatever season you find yourself in, you are encouraged that, again, we are playing the long game. We're teaching the word of God to students, knowing that God uses his word to do the work. So this has been episode 46 of the Word and Youth Ministry. Phil, thank you for joining us. Um, again, I just want to remind our listeners, especially right now, if you're driving um, and you're going to stop soon, then drive some more. Episode 37 is like a foundation to this episode 37, which was scope and sequence of a youth ministry teaching calendar. And then in this one, uh, Phil has told us a little bit about um, how he has taught. And I'm just excited about some um, future episodes we have as we continue to think about teaching the word in our youth ministries. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for listening to the word in youth ministry. To learn more about CPYU and the resources mentioned on today's podcast, visit us online at cpyu.org.